Good morning, good morning, good morning, and welcome. We know that COVID has affected communities across the globe. These 12 bi-weekly workshops with Comerica Bank we wanted to make sure that we are finding ways to really just meet the needs of business owners if from various sectors. But I had a conversation with my friends at Comerica Bank and we decided what are we gonna do to respond to this crisis? And what we decided to do was to put together these 12 bi-weekly sense workshops. And what it looks like is nonprofit founders, professional service providers, and corporate leaders are able to remain proactive in in increasing their knowledge and developing their skills as we navigate this post-COVID world together. I am your host, A. Margot Blair, partnership strategist and founder of Discover Her Worldwide, a 501c3 nonprofit organization headquartered in Phoenix, Arizona. Our mission is designed to bridge generational gaps between diverse groups of women. In pre-Rona, we would do this through in-person professional and personal development experiences, such as conferences, trainings, and seminars. As we navigate this post-COVID world at Discover Her, we are cultivating virtual experiences such as this to teach the fundamentals that may have been missed or overlooked, equip you with actionable steps that you can apply to your business and life today, in addition to growing our networks. So before we dive all the way in, you know there has to be some housekeeping, again, especially with this virtual world. So everyone, myself, Summer, and our guest facilitator, Amber, we're going to pose for a second so you can snap a picture. Ladies, get ready. Perfect, perfect. Okay, so you can go ahead and take that picture. And I'm sure that you, regardless of what your preferred platform is, whether it's LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, even Pinterest, go ahead and just make sure that you, as you're taking notes, you're going to those particular platforms and sharing your major lessons, your major takeaways from today's conversations, because I guarantee you it's going to be a good one. You can go ahead and post even the photo that you just took of us to your timeline. And again, when you post those posts, make sure you use the hashtag Comerica Business Sense Bootcamp Series. What that allows us to do is to go back through and, and really see what you see from the conversation today, as well as the others. And as always, share, share, share with another founder who you know could benefit from this conversation that we're having today. For those of you who aren't new to us, I'm sure you already have your notepad and pen ready. If you don't, go ahead and get it ready. But again, in any quotables that you take, go ahead and share, um, tag us in those, and again, share. We also wanna give another announcement. The nonprofit pitch competition is open. We, you all know that Comerica Bank is, is our sponsor for this 12 weekly series. However, they are also sponsoring a $1,000 cash prize to a nonprofit founder. And so you can get all the details if you go over to discoverher.org backslash Comerica Business Bootcamp. And we just want to make sure that we are supporting you along your journey. And what better way than some cash money, baby? So again, we are super, super excited to have you and let us go ahead and dive in. So with, without further ado, Summer, just take it away. Thank you so much for, for being here, for really seeing the vision and just joining us at, you know, as, as we put this together. It wasn't, it wasn't a first thought. There was a, lo there was a lot that went into this, right? Not just, mm -hmm. hey, go and get some work. Jobs. We wanted to make sure that we were bringing some really heavy hitters, not just some basic conversations, right? Like, tell us, like, why did you be part of this? And again, just thank you so much for being here, Summer. Yeah, thank you so much, Margot. You know, Comerica Bank is, um, it, we're, we are a large bank and sometimes certain communities and certain people can get lost in, in the system. And that is one of our main goals that we we help our community. We know what our community is going through. And so we can either bear the brunt or help out or see what we can do to make sure that our systems are in place to make sure that both the community and the bank thrive. So the great thing with the boot camp is it's kind of just um, a compilation of everything we were teaching in our business sense program. And that was a foundational program for 
um, longtime entrepreneurs or beginning entrepreneurs, just knowing how, what the foundations of running a business is. Kind of those things where you might be the best cookie baker in the world, but if you don't know how to run a business, it doesn't matter. Your cookies won't go further than your front door. So we really wanted to kind of implement that in a fast paced, really quick, how do we survive COVID type of breakdown? So it is a smaller version, but a very concentrated version of our business sense program put into a boot camp. And thank you so much, Margo, you have been able to kind of expand on what we normally do. Normally our boot camps are honestly four, four separate seminars. We are doing 12 with Discover Her. To be honest, she's the only organization that we're doing 12 separate boot camps with and that's huge because you're not getting the same information every single time you're getting dialed in focused concentrated information for these hour long hour and a half long sessions each and every time and it's so much different for a nonprofit than it is for a for-profit because for a nonprofit, you go into business to help the community a for-profit you go into business to help yourself so right. there's a big difference in, in kind of the, the focus and the mindset of a for-profit business owner. And that's what Margo has um, allowed Comerica to kind of dial in on and, and help out. So I am so excited to be here, um, excited to continue along our, com our conversations. And I will sit here. I am excited for this conversation to see about outsourcing and hiring virtual team members. I mean, that's a huge thing, honestly. I should probably have an, an outsource assistant right now, but <laughs> I don't. <laughs> so I will learn as much as you will learn and we'll continue to grow together. So thank you so much for having this partnership and hosting the Comerica Sense Boot Camp, Smargo. Thank you so much, Summer. Again, you are phenomenal, not just for seeing the vision, but again, just being part of it, right? Because again, you're not just, okay, here, here's this money. You're, you're present, you're with us for 12 workshops. And so again, <laughs> just super excited that you're here. And you know, at any point per usual, we'll just go ahead and chime in and we'll make sure that we are providing all of them with your contact information for them to be able to reach out to you as well. So without further ado, I am so, so excited to welcome our guest of honor today, Miss Amber Aziza. Hello, Miss Amber. Hello, how are you? <laughs> I am so, so well today. I'm, I'm really excited for our conversation and for a number of different reasons, but I, I wanna make sure to introduce you properly, right? It's not just, here's the mic, let's go ahead and dive in. I wanna make sure to introduce you to the audience and, and really help them get a clear understanding of who you are, what you're bringing to this conversation and why it's really, really important. As Summer mentioned, as we discussed, some of the, um, a lot of the people who are tuning in are nonprofit founders, they're nonprofit business owners. And these conversations aren't taught in your common business training program, as you know, because you have an extensive amount of experience. And so I just want to, again, just share a little bit about Aziza. And so for everyone, welcome Aziza, give her a hand clap for those of you who are tuning in live here with us, as well as streaming on Instagram. We are on Instagram today, you everyone, as well as Facebook. So Amber Aziza, founder and CEO of AAE Corporation, as well as Facebook. There we go which houses multiple subsidiaries, has made it her life's work to provide innovative organizations with expert solutions. Amber learned every facet of a successful and engaged workforce and used her skill sets to build two, that's four, two <laughs> award-winning <laughs> training and development departments, being recognized internationally as the millennial whisperer for her unique ability to engage millennials within the workplace. Through AAE, Amber and her team of global consultants and experts have quickly become secret weapons of some of your favorite brands, HR and recruiting teams. She currently divides her time between Nashville and London, UK, where AAE teams are located. Again, Amber, Thank you so much for joining us all the way from London this evening, which is evening over there. So while most of us are, are so while you most would be uh, winding down their evening with their beverage of choice, you are here with us. So thank you again. <laughs> yes, happy to be here. I'm so excited that you are here with us. So 
the conversation today is outsourcing, how to hire your virtual team. Mm -hmm. And if anything that I missed in, in your bio, you can go ahead and add that too. But first and foremost, we have founders with us, right, at different stages of their journey. Most though, they have been established, but they didn't lay a solid business foundation the first time around. That's who you're speaking to today, Amber. And so with that, can you just briefly, from the beginning, take us from Amber day one, I'm going to start a business, to Amber, the international business mogul? Right. So Amber day one, I want to start a business was a very, what I call millennial moment. It was kind of almost a millennial tantrum, so to speak. I was an executive making six figures a year um, at a financial services company, and I did the people side. I love, oh, let me turn that down. I love the people end of it. Um, so for me, it was always a natural fit that if I should ever leave the corporate side, that I would focus on the people side of business. Um, but I left because I found out that the owner of my company bought an island and I was very upset about that. Um, and I thought, I'm doing all the work. I do not understand why he's able to reap the benefits and I work all the time. He's right. never here. So for me, it was really a moment of kind of like, this is it, I'm done, <laughs> walked away. Uh, and from there, I started my company. I had to move back in to my parents' home in Ohio. Um, so you sometimes you've got to like eat crow and take a few steps back to take a few steps forward. So I moved into my parents' home, into their basement, and their basement. Um, and what I think I did first that I tell all of my entrepreneurs to not do is I immediately went to build a team. Like that was my first go-to because I'm corporate. So from corporate, all I knew was build a business, right? You build a business, you have a team. The team does the work, you have the vision. I did not realize that entrepreneurship itself was not like that. And that I had to first build out a model and know what I needed to do and know what I wanted to do um, before I could build out a team. A team is not you. They are not many versions of you. People often think that, oh, having a team is just a mini version of me. Like I'll have just many me's around. Nope, they're not. You are the brain of your organization. Your team are the arms, the hands, the feet, the mouth, the eyes, the ears. They are the ones pushing the vision forward, but your brain is the one that has to communicate to the team that the vision has to happen. And so I think that once I was able to understand that, once I was able to see that, then it was like, okay, let me do this a little differently. Let me set up processes. Let me know what exactly how I want things done so that then I can have a team that actually can do it. And from there, we've been able to build, we have four companies under the AAE brand. Uh, we have uh, a team of executives. We have an army of virtual assistants and our entire uh, WT2 team is completely uh, full, they're completely remote. So we work on a role model, which is called results only work environment, which means you can work when you want, from where you want, however you want, as long as the work is done. So we've been able to really make a lot of progress and accelerate the business rapidly, much rapidly than people who started around the same time as I did doing the same things. We've been able to really operate our business on an accelerated path because of our team. I love that on so many levels. Again, you take us through this process of what it was like from the very beginning right and just when you when you get to a point and you're seeing other people do these I mean right we're, so we're talking about corporate for for some people you see these people doing little when you're doing so many different tasks and you're like wait why am I only taking home $18 an hour this doesn't even make sense right mm -hmm. but then you have the other people who they, they dominate in the corporate world and entrepreneurship may not be for them so you have all of these different backgrounds or opportunities for those mm -hmm. specifically who do to decide to go on the entrepreneur route take heed to what Amber just said the first thing she did out the gate was build a team <clears throat> Let's talk a little bit more about that, Amber. When you built the team, did you vet these people? 
what was your process of just bringing on all of these people? What roles did you bring on? And was it strategic or were you just like, okay, I've seen it before, I'm gonna do it here? So for me, I was trying to replicate what I had seen in corporate. So it was like, okay, you have a COO. Let me find somebody who could be my COO. Okay, you have a CMO. Let me find someone who could be my CMO. Let's find a CFO. Like, it was just like, it was a lot of poor choices. I'm not even gonna lie. It was a lot of really poor choices because I was trying to replicate what I'd seen in corporate because that was the model that I, and the formula that I needed that worked. And the reality is, it didn't work, not for the size that I was, not for the scale that I was, not for the type of business that I was. And I think that was a mistake that a lot of people make is trying to replicate someone else's results using their formula instead of realizing every formula you see, you've got to tweak it to match what you need. So big. And, and thank you for pointing that out. We actually get talked about this last segment. And so I think you were there. But nonetheless, what we talked about was when we see other people, right? We we see the Tony Robbins, we see the Amy Porterfields, right? Or you know, whomever is the guru in your industry. We see these individuals doing their launches and we're like, ooh, I'm gonna do that too. I'm gonna do it this way. But we we look, we need to look at it as an iceberg. What's happening when we see it is years, days, weeks of planning prior to us being able to see it. They've troubleshooted, right? They've failed, they have fail safes in place for when things don't work out effectively. And so what we don't see is the iceberg, the, 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 the under, the bottom part of the iceberg that's submerged underwater, right? That where they're, you know, doing things wrong, they're trial and testing, they, you know, they're looking at what isn't working, they're, they're doing the A-B testing. And so again, just really to your point, Amber, I think it's monumentally important as, as all of us who are uh, tuning in today, when we're looking at, are we even ready to, to hire team members? Okay, we're ready to hire team members. Now we're putting out the net, you know, right, we're casting our nets. And then we are, in the thick of it. We are hiring and we need to make the best decisions for our business. There are different strategies that we have to have in place. So Amber, if you could, can you just take us through that journey? What is that journey like preparing, right? So you've done it wrong, you've learned, you probably did it wrong one or two more times after that until you really figured out. Um, because what I will tell you everyone, when I email Amber, I get this lovely email back and it's not just here, you know, I'll be back and I'll get back to you in 24 hours. There's emails of, okay, if you're looking for this, call, contact this person, here's their email. And there's several others. So again, Amber, can you just take us all just through that process? What does that look like? Phase one, phase two, phase three. So the first thing you need to do is you need to make sure that you understand fully with your organization what you are not the greatest at. So when I looked at the things I was doing, I was doing a lot of marketing pieces. So I would do videos and I would create these you know, long blog posts and all of these things that were great for creating engagement, but were time sucks for me because it wasn't my, it wasn't my calling, right? It wasn't my lane. Um, it would take me like three hours to edit a 15 minute video <laughs> and it would just take forever. <laughs> no matter how many tutorials I watched on YouTube, it would just take me forever to do it because it just wasn't my jam. It wasn't what I was really good at. And so what I tell people to do is as you're going through your business, as you're building it, look at the things that are taking you way longer than you feel like it should. Those are gonna be the first tasks you need to outsource. And your first team member doesn't have to be a full-time team member that's on payroll. It can be a freelancer. It can be someone that you've gone on Fiverr or Upwork and found that can help you with you know, this one project or this one task. If you don't have videos weekly that you're doing, there's no need to hire a full-time videographer or video editor. It doesn't make any sense. If you're not doing podcasts regularly throughout the year, there's no need to hire a podcast editor. You can go on sites that are fine freelancers that can do that for you on a project base. Save yourself time, save yourself money, save yourself headache, right? The second phase is those full-time positions. When you start saying, okay, I think I need help. It's always 
the executive admin position that usually is the first one people run to. And I can't say that that's necessarily wrong because it frees up a lot of time. If you email me at my email address that's public facing, you will get a response. And at the bottom of it, it will say, uh, on behalf of Amber Aziza. So it'll say someone's name on behalf of Amber Aziza. You will rarely get an email that's directly from Amber Aziza. Why? I don't have time to be sitting and reading emails all day. <laughs> I have four companies that I run, a hundred plus employees. I do not have time to sit and read emails all day. So my team was trained on how to do it. So I have executive assistants, but that's what they do. They read the emails, they schedule the appointments, they make sure everybody has the links that they're supposed to have. They manage the, the in and out comings and goings of our team and correspondence between the team and me. They're my liaison. So I would say, you know, if you're looking for what's my ideal first position to hire, an admin that can help you pick up some of those admin pieces. If you're spending five or more hours a week on admin tasks, then when you can afford it, the first role you need is an EA, an executive admin, someone who can help you with that. Um, and then from there you look at, okay, what are some other things that I need to grow? So right now we're in expansion mode, severe expansion mode. We just hired a creative director and an operations director and a marketing director. And those are the roles now that will help us with growing and accelerating the business. But had you talked to me four years ago, I was just worried about having a, a good graphic designer full time. Like, can we get somebody who can create our worksheets and our workbooks for when we do trainings for clients? Like, can we, can we get someone to do that piece first? So what you need will depend on the phase that you're at and what's important to you. Now, there are some things that I love to do, and I don't think I'll ever necessarily fully let them go. Uh, anything revolving around our processes for training and development or our processes for uh, onboarding, offboarding uh, employees for our clients, our processes for going in. Sometimes we go in and manage full HR departments, like we become the HR department. So our processes for doing that, I, I like to have my hands in that because that's my jam. That's what I love. That's what the company is built on is my philosophy and process of doing things. But the actual execution of it I couldn't possibly go out to 52 different client companies and say, hey, I'm going to be the person that does this for you. It's not possible. So when you're thinking about the roles you want to hire next after you get the basics of the EA and the graphic designer and whatnot, the next thing you need to think about is how do I scale my business and what items am I doing right now that aren't scalable if I continue to do them? If you're a coach, it is not scalable for you to be the only coach on your team forever. It's just not. So you need to figure out how do you capture what you do, your secret sauce, and put it in a bottle and be able to recreate it and reformat it uh, so that other people can learn it easily on your team. And I think that's one of the most difficult parts is how do I make, remake how I do what I do so that other people can do it, but they're not running off and creating their own, right? I don't necessarily love hiring people with entrepreneurial spirit. I just don't. Um, because if they have an entrepreneurial spirit, once that business is built, once they figure out the sauce, they're gone, right? And then I'm left having to hire again. And some people will say that's selfish, but that's, that's business. We're going to talk real. That's business. So I don't look for people with an entrepreneurial spirit and I don't look for fans. I've done that. I've hired people who follow me on Insta. They follow me on Facebook. I love your work. You're absolutely amazing. And I say, okay, well, let me give them a try. Let me put them in this role. But really, they just want to be a part of the entourage, right? Which there is really no entourage with me. If you, I'm like the biggest, <laughs> I'm the biggest like solo person ever. Like I just want to be left alone, right? I want all the attention and being left alone at the same time. So for me, when I realized like, oh, they would just get in and they wouldn't really do the work. They'd be so worried about like showing that they're working for the company rather than actually doing the work for the company. I said, okay, new rule. If, if they go into fangirl or fanboy mode in the interview, we're not taking them. Uh, so you really have to determine what works for you, what doesn't work for you. Um, and once you determine that, that's when you kind of become stopless in, in being able to hire the people that are gonna work best for you.
you take us through so many different components, Amber, and I love it. And this is why I said, nope, let's let's just give them that combo right now, right? Because again, there's so many different processes for hiring. Number one, mindset. Are you ready? Are you in position? But two things that I want to just make sure to emphasize that you mentioned was it's important to do the tasks that are of your skill set, but that you have to be in the process. Like the process won't work. Whatever your industry is, whatever your do, service or product, you have to make sure that you are in that part of the process for it to continue to go uh, or grow. And the other piece that, that you mentioned, I'm like, ooh, key. You want to be sure to document your process so that you can replicate your process. And again, as... For those of you who've, who've been tuned in before, who have been connected to me for any period of time, you know that one of the main things that I talk about is, is really working with founders who've been in business for a period of time, but they did not lay a solid foundation the first time around. And I, I always put myself on the chopping block. That's one of the things that I didn't do. I had everything up here. I knew my process. I knew what steps needed to take. I knew how to train, right? I have books of curricula. You've seen it. Again, because I didn't document the process when I went to hire and I'm like, I gave you the book. Why, you know, why can't you do this correctly? Well, again, teaching the curricula, there's so, it's not just here's the curricula and go, there's this training process, understanding different teaching styles. How do you answer questions about the content that God allowed me to create, right? There's so many different processes that I didn't even think about because it, certain things came natural to me or because over time I was able to master certain skill sets, speaking, training, and facilitating being some of those that do not come natural the first time you get out the gate. And if you do, come back and talk to me because that's a skill. But nonetheless, Amber, again, thank you so much for that perspective. I think that's super huge that we need to really position ourselves to get ready for the hiring process prior to just diving in to that process. I also wanna look at how has your journey and the experiences, no, back up. I, there was one question before I asked this. What are two or three of the biggest challenges you overcame and what were those lessons waiting for you on the other side in regard to hiring? I want us to get really clear on that. I think that's a big one before we go into the others. Ooh, so. Ooh, so. The biggest lesson biggest. I think that I learned, and, and this is, I, I say this is a twofold, is there is such a thing as hiring too many people too fast. And even if you've sat down and you've done the projections and you're like, I totally can do this, I can totally afford it, it'll be no problem. The problem is, is that when you hire a large amount of people at one time, what happened to us was we had all of these people that were at the beginning phases of their position. But when you have a bunch of people at the beginning phase of your position, no one's at the advanced stage. And so no one can really help the clients that need the advanced stage of their skills. And so what ended up happening was revenue started slowing down, but that payroll stayed the same. Um, and it felt like we were hemorrhaging cash. I mean, there were months that I would have to choose between do we make payroll this month or do I like pay my rent? Do we make payroll this month or are my credit cards this month? And there were a lot of months where I actually had to say, okay, I'm just going to skip rent. Like something's got to give, I got to do it. And it's not the sexiest conversation, right? It's not the thing that people want to talk about uh, when your business is, is making millions, but losing it just as rapidly because you've built this massive team that everyone's still learning. So I would say when you're in growth mode, don't feel like you have to hire everyone at once. You really don't. Um, I actually prefer you not to. Start small, start with one or two people. And then once they're about three months down the line, then add. It may feel like, but no, if I add 30 people right now, I can hurry up and get more clients eventually. And then I'll get more money. But can you sustain that payroll for the six months of your revenue going down? So that was really important to me. Um, I would also say the second lesson that I learned is that, and this is you know one that's kind of controversial, especially in the online entrepreneur community, which is 
all of your employees don't have to be American. They don't. Sometimes it is a, a smarter business option to outsource. Um, so we have a army of VAs, majority are in the Philippines, Mexico, Belize, um, and that saves us a lot of money. Now we do have consultants that are full-time and based in the US and the UK. Um, well, actually most of them are all over now, but they're <laughs> US or UK rates. Um, and so, you know, you understand that there are some roles that it just makes more sense to outsource it and that's okay, but you have to make that decision for you and your business as to whether or not that works for what you want to do with your business. Um, I think a lot of times people get a stigma against outsourcing. They're like, oh, I don't, I don't want to outsource. I don't want to use somebody overseas because, you know, I don't know them. And it's like, you don't know the people you're hiring here. And it's like, well, they may try to, you know, steal my stuff you have a much higher <laughs> likelihood of your stuff being stolen by someone here. Um, and that's not to say get rid of your American staff and replace them, but it's to say in those roles where you're saying we're spending a lot of money on this and it's not necessarily directly generating revenue, then you can say, okay, maybe we outsource this. Maybe we find someone who is very skilled at what they do, but doesn't necessarily live here in the US, well, or in the UK where I am. Um, so, you know, don't always feel like it has to be, you know, all my staff has to be in America, all my staff has to be in the country that I'm living in. It doesn't. Um, there are so many more options, especially with technology today and systems that are there that will help protect your systems and protect your passwords like LastPass and Team Password. Um, you can have them have access to everything they need to have without actually having access to your passwords or the ability to shut down your accounts or any of that. Um, so I, I highly recommend checking out your outsourcing options. Whenever we, one of our companies is a recruiting firm. And one of the things that we do when we get these, you know, major Fortune 500 companies coming to us is they'll say, hey, here's a breakdown of all of the things we need done, every single task we need done by this person. And they'll say, but we're only paying $125,000 a year. And it's like, that list is like a 250 a year minimum <laughs> position that you just gave us. And you want us to find somebody who's going to only want 125 a year? Like, are you for real right now? Like that is not gonna happen even during a recession, ain't happening. And so, you know, oftentimes what we'll say is, you know where you would be able to save some money is if you took this, 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 and this task, rolled those up into one position, found someone, a VA overseas who could do that work for a fraction of the rate. And then you can hire your 125 person to do the core things of this position and not bog them down with those other things that are going to make them immediately say, no, my rate would have to be higher. So, you know, and that's on a larger scale, right? Fortune 500 scale. So when you're looking at solopreneur scale, when you're thinking about the positions you're hiring, that EA doesn't have to be in the States. Sometimes EAs in the States will be charging you 40, 50, $60 an hour to answer your emails. And it's like, I, I could pay my niece $10 an hour <laughs> to answer my emails and she will be just as thrilled and probably be just as efficient, right? Now there are some highly skilled positions that I need to know that they can actually do um, and systems that I need to know they can actually operate. But the reality is, is that I interview and, and ask test questions and give test task, which is really important. You need to give them tasks that they can test uh, so you can see whether or not they can do the work. Um, I do the same for our US employees, our UK employees, our employees that are in Thailand, our employees that are in the Philippines, our employees in Belize, our employees in Mexico. I don't care where you are. You're getting the same process, right? You're getting the same assessments as everyone else. Um, so don't feel like you have to be tied to the country that you're in. And then I think the third lesson I would say is your team are not your slaves. And this is something that I think a lot of entrepreneurs screw up on. I can honestly say, because I come from the people side of business and corporate, I've never made this mistake. But I can say that a lot of our clients, because we will hire VAs for clients all the time, a lot of our clients do that. And so when we work with a small business or a solopreneur, they'll hire a VA or they'll hire a team member and they think this person is supposed to work a ton of hours. Like I changed the hours last minute and now they're saying they're not gonna work those hours. What do they mean they're not gonna work those hours? Those are the hours I want them to work. And it's like, yeah, but that's not what you agreed to at the beginning. 
or, well, I, I gave them the handbook and now they're telling me that they don't know how to do their job. Well, does the employee handbook have the step-by-step -step process of how to do their job? Well, no, but he's the video editor. I would expect he knows how to edit videos. Yeah, he did. He edited videos according to how he knows how to do. You didn't have any SOPs in place for him to follow or branding style guides of him to know exactly what he's supposed to be doing. So he just did what he was supposed to do. Or the expectation of hiring someone and thinking that they're going to get it immediately. They're not. That's at least a 90 day learning curve. Have you ever started a job and immediately just jumped right in and knew exactly what you're doing? No, right? I was in an executive role multiple times where I had at least 90 days to figure out like, okay, wait, who do I email for that? So if you are wondering why your new employee or your new team member isn't getting it on the second week of being your team member, it's because they shouldn't, right? They shouldn't. And it's okay for them not to. Now, if they do and they're the exception to the rule, they're a superstar, that's amazing. But you still also have to recognize they're not your slave, they're your employee. They have a life and a family outside of their business. And so you cannot expect them to be as invested in your business as you are. Because at the end of the day, if your business fails or succeeds, it's on you. And if your business fails, they'll just go find another job. So you cannot expect them to be up all night with you, working in the midnight oil, <laughs> burning the midnight oil, you know, busting their behind, doing all these things when it's not their business, right? So I think those are kind of my three lessons I would say that people should really be aware of when they're looking to hire people. I told you, you all were going to get some gems. And again, this is <laughs> this is mine and Amber's first time talking. And here's the beautiful thing. I think every speaker, every facilitator we've had, I'm like, ooh, that's good. Ooh, I need to shift my perspective. Ooh, I need to cut their hour. No, but you you make several really great points just in your lessons. And, and I, I am an avid believer that when you connect with people who have mastered areas where that you're looking to delve into, or you just need really sometimes just need a little bit more clarity and perspective on, on what that realm looks like. One of the things is to learn from people who've done it before and you've done it before. Right. And so I, I thank you for sharing that. I thank you for sharing your, your stories of, of challenges. Because one of the things that I teach my students and clients is that let me teach you these things so I can help you expedite your learning process. Now, I'm not going to do the work for you, but I can expedite your learning process so you don't have to learn the things that I experienced over the last decade, right? And so I think that's super big. And, and so again, thank you so much for sharing that. I, I feel it's really important that not only do we look at the challenges, but we also look at how these challenges molded us. And so can you also just share how did that journey, those journeys really, and those experiences mold you into the leader that you are within your businesses? I think that's so key. So I've had to work at the leader part um, continuously, even since I was in corporate and had a team in corporate, I knew that I'm a great CEO, I'm a great visionary, a great leader, I was not, right? I often was the person that would say, you know, here's this task, you've got three days to figure it out, go for it. Um, it got to a point where when I saw, so we use a system called Screenshot Monitor for our hourly employees. And what it does is it randomly just takes a screenshot of their screen, making sure that they're working. It's mostly for when we have to bill our clients. So when we need billable hours proven, they want to have proof that it's actually happened, especially if your team's not with you. So we use like screenshot monitor to do that. And so we were going through screenshots and our CFO thought it would be funny to send me a screenshot of two of our employees who were having a little bit of a chat um, between themselves. And in it, it said, um, Miranda, uh, Miranda wants this project done. Can you get it done? And, and so then they put a GIF of Miranda Priestley from The Devil Wears Prada. And I realized they were talking about me. And I was like, oh, they think I'm mean. I mean, we set out to have this amazing company culture, right? And that's one of the big pieces of it. We will pay for holidays. We give paid holidays, regardless of which country you're in. We honor your country's government holiday holidays. So if your family got off, you got off. 
Uh, we give PTO to VAs, which is unheard of. You know, we, <laughs> we, it closed down for the entire month of December, our entire team, no one works, they all get paid. Uh, and, you know, we really work hard to create this awesome company culture where people feel supported and they can talk to us about anything. And here I was thinking I was doing this amazing job and they thought I was like Miranda Priestley from the Devil Wears Prada. And I just, I, I honestly, it was the first time I, I like to say, you know, I'm, I'm a G, I'm not gonna cry. I cried. I cried because it hurt my feelings wow. more than anything, more than anything else. else. And so all I could think of was I've created this environment for them that feels hostile. And so I said, okay, how do I fix it? I need to fix it. And so we realized that the reason I, they felt that way was because I was so short in my messages to them. So when you're operating virtually, you can't necessarily hear tone of voice when you're in a meeting, right? Um, when, you're, when you're in a meeting, you can hear it, but when you're sending a message, when you're getting a Slack note, when you're getting an email, I am short and to the point, right? I just posted something on my Instagram that said, if, if it can be sent in a text, don't call me. I'm the same way. Like if this could have been an email and you had a whole meeting about it, we got a problem. So for me, I'm always answering messages, but you have to remember it's across four companies, multiple employees, multiple executives, multiple clients. And so I tend to be very short and to the point, but what I realized was that our Asian team members were taking that as offensive because they were like, she's not like, she's no good morning, no hello, there's no conversation. It's just, send me this report on this, or did you get an email back from so-and-so? And so I remember, I realized I have to adapt my leadership style to match my team's management style. They all need to be managed in different ways. And I needed to adapt to that. I need know that my EA, she needs a little bit of loving in the morning. I need to ask her about her day. How's your kid? Like she needs that. If she doesn't get that, she's going to be in a crummy mood the rest of the day. So I know I need to give that to her. And so taking that time as a leader is your responsibility to learn what your team needs best to operate at the maximum efficiency for your team. If they feel like they aren't being heard or considered or that they feel like you're looking at them like a cog in the wheel, if they feel any of that, then they're going to bounce and find another job because there are plenty of other jobs out there. Even in a recession, there are plenty of other jobs out there. And so I had to learn how to love on my team. And that would be the big mistake I think I started out with was I just, you're working, you're getting paid. That equals happiness, right? <laughs> you're getting paid, you're getting a paycheck. I'm helping you out with, you know, all of the stuff you're getting the resources that you need to do your job. We pay for trainings, like this should be happiness. And the reality was it wasn't. And the funny, this thing is that we're hired by companies to build their employee engagement. And the same thing we were doing for companies, I wasn't implementing myself because I didn't have time. I was too bogged down. Um, and so once I took the time to learn that, I realized I needed another arm, another version of Amber uh, to help with some of the bigger pieces so that I could have the time to really focus on my team. So we hired a chief business development officer who took off a lot of stuff off my plate. So now I have time to say, hey, how's your day? Hey, how's it going? I have time to hop into their team meetings and say hi. And you know, they've even said it's a very different Amber than what it was two years ago. Again, so many, I'm like, okay, what do like how what do I want to say next? Like there's so many <laughs> different gems in that. And and just one of the when you first started sharing about that, I was like thing, yes, being a people leader versus a people manager. You were like, let's get it done. This is what we're here for. But two, you also had multiple businesses. So you had to make sure that you were prioritizing your time. And this is just a separate point to bring it back here. I think it's really big to understand the difference between and I know a lot of people teach about priority or time management and this is what you need to do to put your time here and make sure you block off your calendar and this and that well that's one aspect of it what are their priorities and so 
one of the things that I make sure to do is, you know, I have my week or, you know, my month, my quarter, there's different ways that I break that down for the goals that, that our business that we desire to achieve. And then I actually reverse engineer my process. That's the same thing that I teach my clients. And it's big that you mentioned this, Amber, you said that the things that you were doing for other businesses, right? Like you had clients, you were doing these things, teaching their companies to do these things for their employees. Yet we, you at the time weren't doing this in your own business. And I mean, if we were in person, I would say, let me see a show of hands for those of you who've been there before, <laughs> right? So let's see a virtual hand, but no, truly. I, and I think that's so important because the reality of this is that we need to make sure that when we're going through this process, not just let's practice what we preach, but understanding the difference between being a people leader and a people manager. Yes, the tasks need to be done, but how can you make sure to continue to have a healthy, a positive, and in, in a supportive culture for your company? We always say this. We always say this. I know Summer kind of drives this point home for us, but nonprofits should be profitable. You have to be running your business like a real business because you are. So again, Amber, thank you so much for that. I think that that's going to share, you know, shed so much light there. And I just want to, because you, you mentioned you had to hire a chief business officer and I just got a, uh, I just saw a comment pop up. Do you have any uh, advice or tips for what should be the first few team members? I know it's going to be different, right? For your industry and what you're looking to achieve and the goals that you have for your business. But do you have like, okay, these are the first three to five people that you should bring on. I know you already mentioned the, um, the, the, the VA, right? Like that would be a really good person to just delegate some simple tasks. But what other um, positions might you, might you advise? But, you know, it really depends on, on your business and, and what it is. If you are a nonprofit, sorry, I'm going to back. Um, if you are a nonprofit, then you may need, you know, fundraisers as your first position. Um, if you are a construction company, then you're probably going to need to workers, physical, actual construction workers as their first hires, you know, and a, and a superintendent and a project manager. So it really does depend on your company. But again, looking at the positions are less of, okay, who can I hire first? And more of what do I need done that's beyond my capacity or that takes me way too much time to do now? Once you can make that list, those are the first positions you need to hire are those people who can help out with those pieces. For me, I was realizing that editing videos, writing blogs, doing all that content stuff, it's great, it's wonderful. It wasn't my thing. I needed to bring somebody else in who could do that. So we hired a video editor. Um, and then I realized I don't have time to manage my calendar, especially at the time I was traveling the world um, and in different time zones every month. So I need somebody who can focus just on my calendar and my emails and make sure that they all collide and they all make sure, make sure that they're all aligned and that if anybody is scheduling an appointment that they're not having to have their appointment moved 8 million times because I miscalculated the time zone. So, uh, you know, so I hired an EA to do that. And then when I realized that, okay, I'm not great at sales sales aren't my jam. That's not my thing, right? I'm, I'm good at the process. I'm good at the brain type of things that, you know, are the brain of the business, which is HR and people management and training and development. That's my jam. Sales is not my jam, right? My brain wasn't wired for sales. So let me hire someone whose brain is wired for sales. Um, so what you hire depends on what you need. Um, and every business is completely different as to what you need. I wish I could say, you know, here's this perfect list of, you know, first six positions you have to hire. But the reality is, is that it depends on, on the business type that you have and it depends on who you are. So you may have the exact same business as me, but you may say, sales are my jam. I totally can do it. I love sales. So if that's the case, then sales may not be the first person that you hire. It might be something else that you're not as strong in. Maybe it's instructional design that isn't your jam. And so you hire an instructional designer, right? So it really depends on, on you, your company, and what your goals are. 
again, so, so many key elements there. And, and I, that's, that's actually why I wanted to make sure to ask that question, because it's not just a cookie cutter answer. These are the people that you need and it's across the board, you know, for every business. And so I just wanted to make sure that we're, that we're reemphasizing that. I love this. So keep asking your questions. I'm seeing them here on Instagram. I'm seeing them here on Facebook. Keep asking your questions because they're really, really good questions. We're going to get to those just soon. I wanted to first ask you, Amber, these three initial questions to really paint the picture of the journey for some, as well as a reminder for others to keep on going, right? And, and I really think it's important now that we just dive a little bit deeper because again, we're here outsourcing. We've been having the conversation, but now I want us to really look at a few things. And so I want to ask you, you mentioned it a little bit earlier, but I want us to go back to this. And then again, we're just going to keep on going. You are the founder of exactly how many businesses, as well as how many employees do you have? <laughs> I said, she's going to ask me how many employees we have. And I have not done accounts. And that is, that is terrible. Um, so we that have just means you have a few. Days. That just means yeah, you have a few. Yeah, we have more, more than a few, more than a few on hand, right? Uh, so we're still a small business <laughs> by uh, the um, SBA standard of what a small business is. So we have four companies, and we are building out our fifth. So our fifth company will be launched in January. All of them have a thread of similarity. So we have team members that can work on all of the businesses. And then we have team members that only work in specific businesses. Um, it's really just about who's good at what. And if you can multitask really well, you're probably going to be a part of the parent company, which is AAE. But if you are a beast mode recruiter and that's what you do, we're gonna put you in recruited, right? So it really just depends on what they do. Um, roughly total, we have 120-ish employees. We just had an orientation this week, so I can't tell you for sure. Um, but we have uh, an army of VAs that support each company and they support them in each different ways. Each pod, so I call them pods, which are projects that are working on um, teams that are working on specific projects, each pod is going to have anywhere between four to 12 VA supporting it. Um, and we have about eight pods. So it really just depends. And then we also have contractors. So some of that 120 are contractors, people that we say, hey, we have a very specific project we need you on. Um, specifically like DEI. So when DEI became the big thing that every company, we like, we need help with DEI we got slammed to the point that we had to start interviewing diversity, equity, inclusion consultants and trainers and IDs like in waves, <laughs> like so many. And so by doing that, we said, there's no need, because remember I said earlier, there's no need to hire somebody if you don't have to hire them full time. If you can just use them as a contractor, then do so, or use them as a freelancer, then do so. So we knew that there were some companies that had smaller projects that they said, you know, we only really want trainings on this, or we only really want an audit. We only really want you guys to come in and audit our diversity. Like, how diverse are we? Like, you know the answer, but we'll give it to you in, in a very broken down manner uh, that justifies your next year's budget request. So when we did that, there was no need to hire a slew of DEI consultants full-time. That would have made no sense because what happened, as all of you know, is that DEI waves slowed down, right? The companies that had put up the black squares and sent out the amazing emails, all of that slowed down. So had I hired all of these people full-time, I now would have had payroll for people who wouldn't have really had anything to do after their projects ended. And so, by having them on as contractors instead, it gave them revenue, it gave us people who knew what they were doing and we could train in our way of doing it and the peace of mind of knowing that those projects would be covered so we could take endless clients that were coming in. We didn't say like, no, we can't take you. It was like, nope, come on in, come on in. Now there were a couple we didn't take just because their values didn't align, but that's a whole different, whole different interview. Um, so uh, for us, our contractors really help supplement and support 
our full-time employees and our VAs whenever we have projects that we know are probably not going to be long-term and probably not going to be recurring. I'm going to call that smart hiring. You exactly. talked about the full-time, you talked exactly. about the part-time, but the contractors, that that's a sweet spot. And that's really what I've been able to do with a lot of corporate companies um, as well. Because just as you said, you're not going to hire somebody with the entrepreneur spirit. I'm like, look, you don't need me for the full-time. Like, I promise you, like, yes, if you try and hire and train somebody to do this, it's likely not going to work, but bring me in. I'm going to give you three weeks, six months, however. And I prompt like, I, I will leave you better than we, than I found you, I promise. And, you know, of course, that's not how I say it. Definitely more professional than that. But at the same time, when I'm able to go in there and I bounce out, the beautiful thing is we, we do that comparison, right? Because before I even do any of those as a contractor, I look and I do the gap analysis. Like, okay, where are you now versus where you want to be? Okay. And I do, of course, the, like the check-ins through that process. But then at the end, especially to have an amazing testimonial, I say, three weeks ago, six months ago, you know, however long the contract, the terms of the contracts are, I'll say, this is where you were before. And this is where you are. You are now. Did you meet the goal? Did you surpass the goal? What does that look like? And again, like I said, it can be an amazing testimonial, but two, even deeper than that, I it's, it's them understanding that they don't necessarily have to go that full, you know, the, that to the full extent of hiring a team member that's really going to just cut in to their overall revenue and additional profits. And so I think that's really big that you mentioned that, because um, again, we need to really make sure that we're hiring smart. And, and so with that one point, just a quick question for you. Have you ever worked in the early stages? Have you ever worked with an HR team for your hiring process? And would you recommend that? whether you have or not? So I did not work on an HR team. Um, the reason I didn't work with an HR team was because I had an HR and recruiting background. Um, so for me, it was like, yeah, I'm getting some feedback um, on my end. Okay. Oh, there it goes. Okay. Uh, so I have uh, an, an OD background, organizational development. So training, HR, recruiting, all that, that's my jam. So for me, it made no sense for me to hire an HR, you know, partner or HR team to build my team for me, um, especially since that's what we do as a company. Um, so once our team was built and we started um, really working on growing our team, um, we still really didn't use an HR team. We used our internal HR team, which was our recruiting firm, uh, to build the HR team. However, if it is not your jam. And I tell them this all the time, I love using the word jam because people can relate to it, right? It's this beat that you're like, yeah, I love this. If you're not like, yeah, I love recruiting. Then don't hire on your own, please. Please don't. Like there are professionals, like we have a whole organization dedicated to helping people like you hire your team members. So please don't feel like you need to do it on your own. And here's why. First, you don't know where to look, right? You're posting on Facebook saying, hey, I'm looking for a VA. If anybody can help me, uh, go ahead and just comment below or send me your email, right? And then you wonder why the people that you hire don't work out. It's because you didn't know where to look. So you just looked in your little network of folks. I don't care how big your network is, it's not big enough to find the team members that you need perfect fits for, right? The second reason is because you don't know what to ask. There are assessments that you should be doing. There are personality assessments. There are skill assessments, speed tests, that some of you aren't doing speed tests with the people that you're hiring. How do you know the internet is sufficient, right? Um, there are certain behavioral questions you need to be asking of your team members before you hire them. All of those things, checking references. Did you know legally you can't ask references a specific type of question and they can't answer in a specific type of a way? You have to ask those questions in a specific manner. So if you don't know those things, don't put those in your own hand. I know we think, oh, well, I'm a small business. Nobody's gonna care if I don't do it right. But that one time that you do it wrong and someone finds out and they call themselves upset with you, that'll be the one time that they report you to the Department of Labor, okay? Um, also, pay is another thing. You may not know how to gauge how for this specific skill set. You may say, well, my buddy, and then 
that was for it. Okay, but where does your girlfriend live? What's their minimum wage? Do you know that you still have to honor minimum wage laws? Doesn't matter what size you are. Like you still have to honor that. Do you understand what the actual compliance are of hiring people? Do you understand um, EEOC laws and regulation? So if you don't understand any of those, I don't care how small you are, if it's just you and you're just hiring somebody part-time, get help. It's better to get help from people who know what they're doing, who can guide you along in that process, even if it's just for your first employee, and then you can take it over from there. But I totally would recommend to get help with that process for you because work smarter, not harder. Hiring on your own can be tough and it can be a headache and it can be stressful and it can feel like, it can feel like tendering, right? If you're, if you've ever been on Tinder and you're like asking all this and you just get so sick of being like, so where are you from? What do you do for a living? Oh, that's cool. What brought you to Tinder? Well, what do you like to do for fun? Like you feel like you're just asking the questions over and over again and getting the same answers. That's what interviewing without help is like. You're just asking the same questions over and over to people who aren't a good fit and you're not getting anywhere. So definitely get the help you need. I'm grateful that we threw that question in there because I'm like, wait a minute. I know even if we don't ask this question, someone may be thinking of it and how do I ask this question? And so I'm grateful. I'm like, okay, thank you. Thank you, God. Like, boom, here we go. So good. So many great gems. I'm, I'm Again, I'm looking at the platforms and people are like, oh my goodness, so many great nuggets, great information. So again, if you have any questions while we have Amber, go ahead and drop your questions here. We have a little bit, we have just over 30 more minutes left for this episode. And we just want to make sure that we're being intentional and in responding to your questions. I know I have some really great questions, but we want to ask you, ask and answer your questions. Okay. So Amber, you, earlier you mentioned hiring outside of the U.S. or your local areas, because again, we actually on Instagram, we have a couple people from Jamaica, um, as well as some other people in London. So let's just broaden that question, right? So how, you mentioned hiring outside of the U.S. or your local area. Mm -hmm. Can you share an overview of what that process looks like or how to go about it? So the first thing that I would say, sorry, getting feedback again. Um, the first, first thing I would say, I would say is to focus on what positions you need and what positions you're okay with outsourcing. Once you decide that, you need to really hone in on what exactly you want them to do. And you need to, when you they say write it and make it plain, you need to write it and make it plain in that job description. Because the absolute last thing you want to do is have something lost in translation. Right. So if you say video editor and they're a video animator, those are not the same. If you say a an audio engineer and they're a podcast editor, those are not the same. Right. So you need to make sure that what you're asking for is totally spelled out. So if you say I need an audio engineer, what do you expect of an audio engineer? What kind of tasks will they be doing day to day? So that job description needs to be very detailed. The next thing you need to do is you need to determine where you're okay hiring from um, and what level of language competency you want them to have. So like internally, we have an, an English assessment. So if you want to hire someone who's overseas, they've already taken an English assessment. So we know uh, on a scale of one to 10, how well their English is. So you're going to want to know, okay, do I want to go to another country that's English speaking and that maybe might have English as a first or second language? And that way you can ensure that you're going to get someone who can be relatively fluent. Remember, fluency in English does not just mean speaking, it also needs to mean writing. So you need to test that as well. Ask them for a writing sample. If they're going to be doing anything client facing, you need that, right? I think the next step after that is when you begin to search, you need to understand the cultural norms of the country you're searching in. So we do a lot of searches in the Philippines. When we decided to branch outside of the Philippines, we had to do a full study and analysis of cultural norms and workplace norms in the countries we were looking in. Because when you're hiring, 
in the Philippines, of course, it's going to culturally be very different than if you're hiring in South Africa. Um, workplace expectations are different in South Africa than they are in Mexico. Uh, so you really just need to gauge that. The other thing you need to gauge outside of cultural norms uh, and workplace cultural norms is pay rate. So you need to understand what is the true cost of living in that country? Oftentimes people will say, well, I hired a Filipino and I'm paying them $1.25 an hour. You're what? I'm sorry, you're what? That's not a livable wage. So you have to look at what's an actual livable wage. I've lived in the Philippines. I went and stayed in the Philippines for six months so that I could get a gauge of how much if I'm only making what I would be able to able to make at $2.50 an hour, $3.50 an hour, $4.50 an hour, what's livable? What's an actual reasonable cost of living? And making sure that you're paying those people what's an actual cost of living. Because you don't want to be hiring people and they're still in poverty, but they're working 40 hours a week for you. That's not, some businesses and some people may be cool with that, but I know the type of people that are watching this are not. Y'all are not that person, right? So we need to make sure that we understand the difference in the cost of living. There are tons of currency calculators for you to be able to see, um, you know, one US dollar equals 30 Thai baht, one US dollar equals 50 Filipino pesos. So really getting an understanding of what does that mean and how does that translate when it comes to living, right? Uh, then once you find platforms that you can find the actual outsourced team members on, so onlinejobs.ph is great for finding Filipinos, um, Upwork, it's great for finding um, if you're looking for folks in Asia or if you're looking for folks in um, Europe, Upwork is really great for that. Uh, I find that we get a lot of freelance help um, that we tend to be able to convince to hire full time from freelance sites like Fiverr, uh, just because they'd rather take a full time gig than to have a project based gig. Uh, so we can go on those sites and usually find pretty good um, help there internationally but we still follow those same process I told you before. We still make sure that the job description is, is listed properly. We still make sure that they understand what we want and we understand what the cost of living is there. Um, next is the interview process. So we do a very detailed, thorough interview process. Uh, the reason isn't because, oh, you're not from here, so I wanna put you through the ringer. It's because we will put everyone through this ringer. <laughs> um, but I always say, you know, don't ask an international employee to do whatever you are. Um, what that does is it automatically from the creates an us versus them. It automatically from the jump creates an us versus them. My team members who are here don't have to do that, but my overseas team members have to do this. I mean, unless it's something like regulation or like sometimes they'll need a proof of, of employment that they have to have printed out and sent to the government, depending on where they live. Unless it's something like that, you really shouldn't be doing an us versus them type of a thing. You should really have the same model regardless. Uh, and then you also want to make sure that they understand what your business does. When they log on, the first thing our recruiter does is they put them through kind of a series of questions that asks about our business. If you couldn't even have the gall to get on Google and Google the business, then why am I going to hire you? I don't care what position you're, you're interviewing for. If you can't Google the business or the person that you're trying to get a job with, I don't care what country you're in, I'm not gonna hire you, right? So that's the big piece. Do they actually, did they take the time to research your business? Uh, the second piece that we wanna know is their speed of their internet. At. Is it going to be sufficient for what we need them to be able to do? So a data miner, who's someone who does online internet research, doesn't need as fast of speed as maybe a web developer does. So we will go on and we'll tell them, you know, hey, hop on Zoom. And then we will ask them to share their screen and then to go to speed test. I think it's like speedtest.net, um, but to go to the speed test site and then to do a test right then and there. It's completely free. And what it does is it shows what's their upload time and their download time. And that will tell you right then and there, like, oh, their download time is, it's 
a really long time. So if I need them to download something, a video to edit it, it's gonna take them an hour just to download it. That's not going to be a good person or a good fit for your role. So you need to understand like what's the speed of their internet. And then next you want to check their references. So you need to ask for references and you need to check those references. Uh, sometimes they will just give you a, a local number. And so I will ask them, please give me references of someone who speaks English that I can call or speak to, or that I can email and that will respond. And I ask for five, five references. We typically only call three, but I asked for five. And you can make international calls on Skype. You can make international calls on um, pretty much any phone app that you download, WhatsApp. Um, but you can make those international calls and call during the day their time to find out, hey, what would you say about this worker? Would you say they're pretty reliable? Uh, you, you know, Would you hire them again? Ask those questions that you want to know the answers to, okay? And then once you do that, you need to have a contract in place if you're going to hire them. Never hire without a contract. If you take nothing else from this at all, never hire someone without a contract, okay? Even your local employees, they need an offer letter or a contract, something in place that says this is the expectation. And every team member must sign a non-disclosure agreement and a non-compete agreement no matter where they are in the world. The non-disclosure agreement is going to basically say they're not gonna go out there and sell, and sell your secret sauce or tell people what your secret sauce is or what's going on in the business, right? The non-compete agreement means they're not gonna go out and rebuild your business from the ground up uh, doing what you do using your method, okay? So you wanna have those two clauses in those contracts. And then once the contract's signed, then we'd have an orientation for them. So you need to truly have an orientation for them. Don't just say, okay, today's your first day. Here's your first task. Here's your email account, go for it. You want to give them a true orientation, an introduction to the history of the company, an introduction to you. Uh, talk about who your ideal clients are. What do you see for the company for the future? So we have a whole full two-day presentation for orientation. Um, and that's just at the stage that we're at. But when we started, because I'm an ultimate trainer at heart, when we started, our orientation was a half day. And I would go in and just say hi. I'd have them introduce themselves. I would then go through and talk about all of the key points in the employee handbook that I need them to pay attention to. We went through our policies. I talked about paid days off and time off, how to ask for time off, all those things that you need to set up on the front end for them so that they understand it. Those are the things we went over in those four hours. Uh, and then I talked about where I saw the company going. I had this really cheesy PowerPoint presentation that was like the future of AAE. And it was like a star, like a shooting star in the sky. I was very proud of it. Um, and now our designers have built like this whole system that puts my poor little PowerPoint to shame. But um, so having a full on orientation, not only gets them you know, fully acclimated to you and your business, but it gives them buy-in. It shows that you took time out of your day to not just say, hey, here's how you start, but you took time out of your day to actually launch them into their position. And there's a whole different feel from I was launched into my position to I was thrown into the deep end. So uh, following that very long extensive process, see now you know why you need to hire people to do this for you. <laughs> Again, this is why I said I, I I wanted to have this conversation. I'm like, okay, who? And I promise you, I was I was I was literally praying. I'm like, okay, God, okay, Summer gave me this task, and I'm gonna bring these people together. Who should speak? And it was clear as day. It was like boom, 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 and Amber. And I'm like, I don't even know Amber. She didn't go say <laughs> yes. Like, why would she say yes to me? Like, what? Like, what are you talking about? And he was like, ask her, shoot your shot. And so again, it was that like one of the things that I always talk about and teach is, is growing your partnership portfolio. It's one of the main things that I talk about. And um, I have a, a great relationship with Derek. He's one of my great friends. And I know he's a, a former client in front of yours. And so I said, hey, everyone looked at this. She commented on this. Can you do an introduction? Bah, bah, bah. And what did he do? He did an introduction. I just shared with you. I'm like, hey, I have this vision. This is what we're looking to do. And, and you were here. Um, you said yes. And 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 so I, that's one of the thing, reasons why I, I stress that 
it's important to establish those relationships, maintain those relationships with people who can really connect you with people in, in different industries. Not we're doing here and having these conversations, but really helping you um, bring a vision that you have to life. And you know, just going on that same that same way. One of the things that 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 we got, one of the questions that we received specifically for you, Amber, is if we're on a budget, what is what is the important way to? How, let me ask this again. Okay, there we go. If you're on a budget, can you discuss the compensation benefits um, for your your for your VAs? But I think that's applicable for any team member. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, if you're, you're on, on a budget, budget um, there are different, different ways, ways to create benefits, benefits for your team members. members. So, so of course, course pay, pay is the biggest, biggest one. They just want to make sure you're going to pay, pay them. them. Sorry, I'm going to back again. again. Um, I, I think it's the IG that's bouncing back. back. Yeah. Let me see. Okay. 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 Um, um, so the biggest feature that they want is, is to be paid, right? But when you're starting out, I like to recommend uh, having certain paid days off looking at the holidays that are local to them and offering those days that are to be off for them. Um, I would also say the first benefit that I offered on a for our Filipino VAs were was in um to for I can not problem <laughs> so I offered insurance and I felt like the biggest baller ever. Uh, I had offered my VA's insurance. And then when it came to offer my American team members insurance, I was like, ooh, that's way more expensive. <laughs> that's way more than $200 a year. <laughs> um, but we offered it. So, uh, but on a budget starting out, you can start by just offering days off, paid days off. You can start by offering training opportunities. You would be surprised how many people don't offer any level of training to VAs that have been with them for years. Um, and sometimes the trainings can be not even necessarily things you paid for. So it could be maybe something that you just know how to do. And you're like, hey, Friday's going to be a training day. Everybody hop in Zoom in your pajamas and we're going to learn about how to build out a PowerPoint presentation. Or we're going to learn how to use Prezi or build out an invoice or how to use Adobe Spark. So having those opportunities to teach them and having those opportunities for them to learn can be a benefit all in itself. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily stress about, you know, offering massive expensive benefits to start out because VAs uh, typically, and, and just contractors in general, when they get started and they get into a business, they know that they're expected to pay for their own. And that's why they typically won't come in for a rate that's like a lowball rate. They want a rate that's really uh, going to be in alignment with what their skill set is because they know they're going to have other expenses they have to pay too. Perfect. Thank you for that. Another, another audience question is, uh, you mentioned earlier the the software for, for the passwords. Can you mention that one again? What was the- um, Sure. Oh, yeah. It's LastPass or Team Password. So those are two sites that you can use. They're plugins, uh, they're Google Chrome extensions, and they'll just store your passwords for you so that they can just simply copy and paste. And I'll drop that in the comments as well, everyone. And then there was another question. So we got Fiverr, Upwork, and Upwork is best for um, hiring from Asia, Europe, as well. There's other, you know, you can do a US as well. And then the one from the Philippines, someone said they got the PH part, but they didn't get the beginning. Oh. <laughs> They're like, I got, I got the end of it. Uh, so it's onlinejobs.ph. Then I believe we, I believe we have one more. I, let me look at this. Okay, can you talk more about the various workplace cultural expectations among the various countries? Why is that important? I feel like you mentioned so, it, but I think it, it, because it was asked again, I'm like, let's let's drive that point home. I think that's a really big yeah. Point. So. The reason it's so important is because if you think about it this way, if you're an American 
and you were sent to Uganda to work and you notice that there is nothing in the workplace that is similar to an American workplace. They're, they're just like cultures are different. Workplace cultures are different country to country. And so would you feel more comfortable if there were elements that reminded you a bit more like home? Yes. Would you be able to do your work more efficiently? Probably because you're not having to adapt and shift and change to what the workplace norms are there. Same thing with your team members, even though they're remote, um, you want to, so perfect examples of when I said, you know, my Filipino staff thought I was mean. They were calling me Miranda Brisley. They thought I was mean um, because I was just to the point. I was just very blunt and responsive. They'd say, hi, Amber, good morning. How was your day? I was wondering if you approved that invoice yet. Uh, the vendor would like to know if we can send off the check yet. Hope you're having a great day. And I would just respond, approved. And they would just be like, Did I make her mad? Like, what did I do? Because I'm just responding in my normal non-American just would have been like, okay, don't approve. All right, let me move on, right? But that's not their culture. Their culture is very much more familiar in the workplace, right? There's much more uh, chatting and there's much more uh, getting to know each other and communication. And to them, I felt blunt and rude. And so, so understanding how to best and, and it's not saying you have to change everything about your company to match their cultural norms, right? But it is saying understand them so that you can understand when they are freaking out that you only gave a one word response and ended it with a period at that, like she must really be mad. Or one day my cap lock was on and I didn't even realize it was on and I was responding to everyone in all caps and everyone was just like, why is she so yelling at me? Um, so, you know, understanding those cultural norms for them in the workplace, understanding how things work in the workplace in their countries will give you better insight to how to be a better leader for them and how to best manage them. They just needed a little bit more love in Amber. Dang. <laughs> they did. They did. They did. No, I love that this so we're, we're in the lab we're in the home stretch everyone thank you again so much for tuning in i just want to just wrap up and leave on a an even higher note i can't i was going to say a strong note it, it has to be higher because you gave so much value i can't even stress how much value you gave today and you know through this conversation i i want to ask you I have mine, but what is one final nugget you'd love to leave the audience with? Mm. The answer to who isn't always you. One of my favorite mentors, Alison Bird, said this to me once and it, it rocked my world. I was like, oh, she's right, right? Because I was too busy trying to be everything in my company. And even when I hired team members, I was still trying to like do their job. Like, <laughs> why did you hire them? You're still doing their work. Um, like they would literally be like, oh wait, you already did that? I just spent three hours working on that. Why did you do it? <laughs> because I just couldn't let go. I didn't know how to delegate. And that was so, so hard for me. But the answer to who isn't always you. Just because you're not the one doing the task in your company, doesn't mean that it's any less your company's ownership of the project, okay? You have to be okay with releasing some of that control. You have to be okay with delegating. And if you struggle with delegation, then you're gonna struggle with leadership because your team's gonna get annoyed with you like they did with me. <laughs> be like, stop working, <laughs> let us do it. So I would definitely say my piece that I would have you take away from this is you know, the answer to who isn't always you. Building a team can always be a great thing, um, but you just have to make sure you're doing it in the right pace and in the right time for you and your needs as a business. Uh, so, uh, I, I can, I can, well. I can go on with that. That is that is so, so big. And so we want to hear from you. For those of us who are here live with us on Zoom, you can share. I want, I want to hear from a few of you. Share with us your major takeaway. And for those of you who aren't with us live, go ahead so you can join us live for the last three. 
we only have three more segments left. Um, so definitely, we want to go ahead and pop yourself off mute um, in a second and just share what your major takeaway was from this conversation. For those of you who are streaming live, we're going to be here for a little bit longer. So go ahead and drop your major takeaway, the major lesson in the comments as well. Um, if we happen to go off on Facebook, you can still drop your major takeaway, but on Instagram, go ahead and um, post a takeaway on your story, tag us, and then we will definitely be sure to shout you out. So we want to hear from you. Uh, for those of you who are with us live, go ahead and pop yourself off mute and share one, just one. I'm sure there were many, but share with us just one major takeaway. And so Mark, you can definitely share too, because I know I'm like, I, I saw your head like, yes, yes, yes. So good. Yeah, I'll start it off. Um, I absolutely loved this session. There was a lot of information, especially if people are coming from the corporate world. When they're when HR, and this sounds honestly, I kind of put all this in HR <laughs> because a lot of it has to do with stuff that you have no no idea about. I mean, most of us when we are in the HR or in the corporate world, we know our jobs, we know our delegations, we know our responsibilities. Everything that Amber's talking about is kind of beyond that. That's understanding foundational information about running a business. And with running your business, you, you of course, you have to hire people if you want to grow. But the answer is, how? How do I do that? So she, she was kind of hitting the nail dead on the head. You have to hire people to do things you don't know what to do. And I'm not, I'm not going to be one of those people who think I, I'm great at hiring. I'm great at understanding people. I might be great at, um, you know, like, I got a weird feeling about that person. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna hire that. That's one person. Like, <laughs> if I have to go through thousands, I'll be done before I hit number five. Like, I will not go past that. And I'll settle. So having someone to do these things for you is, is, is kind of just wisdom and, and knowledge. And that's what I love about the speakers that are here. They've been doing something that we need, you know, concentrated information about, but they've been doing it for years, for decades. So would I listen to my own insight about, oh, I think this person's a great hire. Or would I listen to somebody who's been doing it, maybe tried and failed. They gave us stories about their testimonies about, you know, what they've done. Yeah. I'm going to listen to Amber. She's, she's done the things I know nothing about. So why wouldn't I listen to that side of running a business? So take everything. I certainly did. I mean, I have two other businesses, so we're going to my brother has been talking to me about VA and I'm just like, wonder if I can move them into Comerica a little bit and have them do both. <laughs> but there's so many different things that I thank you so much, Amber, for, for your um, detail and, and everything that you've kind of really dove into. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, for sure. <laughs> I just want to say thank you guys for doing this because again, um, every time we have these, they're amazing. So the, the major takeaway I took from today is just letting go and understanding it's okay for other people to help you, um, trusting, and then if I'm sure I can't do it, to allow someone else to do that for me. Because um, then it's just helping us grow. It's not, it's not holding us back or changing anything about what we do. It's just helping us complete tasks and, and just keep moving forward. So um, that was my takeaway. And I, and again, I just, I thank you because this is just so, so helpful. I, I removed it from the mute. Thanks. It's always good to see you ladies. Thanks for doing this. This is amazing and do know, and I'm just reminding you that this will go out to millions when, after, when you're at home sleeping in the bed, because there's a lot of us, especially in Arizona, that's running around multicasting at work and at our AM uh, before we get to our own businesses. But two things. One, remembering to always use con contracts. I know it. I have them. They're in my file. Sometimes I relax when I shouldn't, and I run several different things, even political things. And that one day, one time when you get too, comfort um, too comfortable, it comes to bite you. Been there, done that with people I used to like, used to love, and, I, and that's a used to past tense relationship based on not doing what I knew I should have did, I should have done. And two other things, the non-compete and the non-disclosure, I've used one and not used the other. Or, and I mean, I have both, I sat down with the legal team and again, that relaxing. And I think it comes with having the confidence and really being serious about your business. 
because, you know, and I'm speaking from my own personal thing that I've kind of let the um, relationship part sometimes blur the line. And if the person pushed back, I'm like, well, eh, like, do we really have to do all this? And yes, absolutely we do, because this is my business. Well, that th this is this has been again a phenomenal, phenomenal experience. I'm sharing across every single platform, and I'll make sure to retag it as well. We are so grateful to to have had you, Amber, just sharing this conversation. I know you snatched some edges, you like some brains were blown, but like this was a really, really powerful and necessary, a really necessary conversation, and. I'm gonna just have to pat myself on the back because I told you we weren't, re we were not from the beginning. I told you we were not pulling any stops with these conversations. I wanted to make sure that again, from experience, I did not lay a solid foundation foundation for my business the first time around. And I had to pay for it financially, emotionally, spiritually, you name it. I had to pay. And I was like, okay, I'm obligated to share this with other people. And so again, I, I took it and I just shot my shot with Amber. Amber happened to say, yes, she's here. And the interesting thing is this is the same for the next three, two of the next three conversations. I just shot my shot. I really didn't even know them from Adam, but I said, hey, I have this vision. This is what we're working on. Would you like to be a part of it? They said yes. And so just prepare, buckle up, continue to stay buckled up rather for the next several conversations go ahead and head on over to discoverher.org backslash comerica business boot camp sent uh, for the opportunity to apply to the nonprofit pitch competition a thousand dollars is waiting for one of you founders so go head on over there um you will be getting a um a feedback form right after this, just sharing your takeaways and sharing what you learned from this just again, so we can continue to bring you some great dynamic conversations. And once again, we just posted into the comments how to connect with Amber on IG, on LinkedIn as well. She's giving a gift to you and it is a recruit ad agency. So just go ahead and click that link and you will be able to connect with Amber. So again, as a final point, Amber, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for just being part of this vision. And we're so honored and grateful to have you with us today. Yes, yes thank, thank you, you for having, having me. I appreciate it so much. much. Absolutely. Okay, everyone, until next time, let's continue making impact. Be well. <laughs>